put together a nice business and, and it operated fairly well for about a year or so until I got into real estate. And after six months in real estate, I said, I'm going full time in real estate. This, this is the game for me. Um, I got, I bought my first property at the age of 19. Um, I used my commission and as I mentioned, rates were 12%. I Hi everybody, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Residual Real Estate Agent. Today we have Mr. Brian Troop himself. Uh, I am excited about this episode for a long time. I've heard a lot of great things about Brian Troop in the community. Things like he's one of a kind, somebody that really cares about his people, uh, did amazing things. For those of you, for those of you that don't know, uh, Troop Real Estate had over 650 agents at some time. So today we're going to get a little bit of, into his upbringing. We're going to get a little bit into his real estate career. Uh, the brokerage, how he went about building Troop Real Estate, kind of what some of the principles that allowed them to do that. And then uh, eventually the transition when he sold and maybe a little bit about investing. So welcome to the show, Brian. How are you? Jose, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me part of your show. I'm honored to be here today. Same here. I'm, I'm truly uh, honored as well, too. So for our viewers that don't know who Brian Troop is, who is Brian Troop? And then how did you get involved in this wonderful world of uh, real estate? So I, uh, who is Brian Troop? I'm a, a local resident of Ventura County. I've been out here since 1980, uh, born and raised in Chatsworth. So I came just up over the hill, but um, I'm a family man. I uh, believe that family is first. I've always put my family up front, even before my career. Um, but how I got started in real estate was um, back in 1978, my father said, hey, Brian, uh, I got a great opportunity for you. Why don't you get your real estate license and you'll find that it's a wonderful career. He had been doing it for about a year. He was with a company called Forrest E. Olson, which is now Coldwell mm -hmm. Banker. Mm -hmm. So I said, Dad, I don't need to go to school. I'm making good money. I own my own business doing uh, carpet cleaning and all this other stuff. And and he talked me into it. He said, look, I'll pay for it. Just go. So I went and um, at the age of 19, got my real estate license and uh, fell in love with the business. I enjoy people. Uh, I enjoy the the day to day um, of helping people out and that kind of thing. So it was a lot of fun. And I early on learned from top producers. I interviewed them in my own company. I said, what do you do that puts you one step ahead of the competition? And now, at the time when I started uh, in 78, 79, rates shot up to about 12% uh, on a 30-year fix. So we're, we're mm -hmm. around 7% today, which is a lot lower than what, what it was back then. But I learned that uh, you got to take care of people's needs first. So um, I learned creative financing back then because it was a niche market. And unless you learned different things and different techniques, you're not going to survive. So I learned all that. And two years into the business, I became top 10 in California for Cobalt Banker in, in sales and um, was just launching my career. I wanted to be president of the company someday. And uh, that was my whole goal back then. And, and then uh, Sears bought out Cobalt Banker in the early 80s. And um, they wanted me to move my real estate business inside a Sears store right next to the uh, T-shirts and underwear and all that. And I said, oh, that's not for me. And and most of um, the people that were involved in Cobalt Banker didn't like the idea either. And at the time, I actually became a sales manager uh, in Simi Valley for Cobalt Banker. And I was the youngest manager in company history. So I was launching my career to manage and do sales and all that. So I left the company um, and went in with a, an independent firm, uh, Tabor Realtors, which was fairly big in Simi Valley. And uh, I helped those guys build a company. Um, and after about three years, um, I realized that they didn't have the same mindset as me. Um, I'm a man of integrity. I'm a man of, uh, if I say I'm gonna do something, I do it whether uh, it costs me money or not. It's important, my word is my bond. And these guys didn't have the same ethics or, or um, way of doing things with the sales force and so on. So. I decided to leave them and open up my own company, Troop Real Estate, in May of 1987. So I uh, started out with a 
very small office, but the one thing I wanted more than anything else is to hire realtors to join me that had that same level of integrity, that cared about the community, that really wanted to help people rather than just help themselves. Because if you take care of people, it's a boomerang effect. It comes back to you tenfold. Um, so that's kind of how I started my career. I'm happy to expound on that. Or if you have other questions, I can kind of share with you how it, it rolled from there. I think what I wanted to get into, and I don't know if the viewers picked up on this, but you said at 18, you had a successful business. So I think uh, you look at uh, a lot of our generation today, like a lot of 18 year olds are barely getting out of high school, getting ready to go to college. So what was the upbringing of Brian uh, Troop like, meaning like, were you a 2.0 student? Were you a 4.0 <laughs> student? I hear that I actually, you had a business. Yeah, I actually was a very good student. I didn't have to work hard at school. It just it came to me very easily. Um, uh -huh. And my uncle, um, who's still alive, he's 90 years old. My uncle Bernie owned a janitorial business in Woodland Hills called U.S. Research and uh -huh. Chemical. Uh -huh. And he got me started. Um, he lent me the equipment and I bought the chemicals and stuff from him to do carpet cleaning, hardwood floor refinishing and window washing. So I was making good money. He taught me how to do all the all the stuff to get the jobs. And I did my own marketing. I used to put ads in newspapers with people actually used to read those ads in the newspaper. And uh, I I built my business on my reputation. I, I showed up, I cleaned up, I did it right. I, I put together a nice business and, and it operated fairly well for about a year or so until I got into real estate. And after six months in real estate, I said, I'm going full time in real estate. This, this is the game for me. Um, I, I got, I bought my first property at the age of 19. Um, I used my commission and as I mentioned, rates were 12%. I assumed the seller's first trust deed. He carried back a second and I used my commission for down payment. No money down. Bought a condo, a three bedroom, two and a half bath condo. I got two roommates and uh, my rental income was 500 a month. My mortgage payment was 750. So uh, that was my first real estate investment at the age of 19 was, was that condo. So I've been buying it. property every year, every year since I was 19 years old. I love that. It's kind of similar to me. Like I kind of did the same thing. I bought mine at 23, a little bit later in life. I uh, went through a midlife crisis. I'm kidding. But um, I have almost bought a property every single uh, year. There's this rumor that I hear that your uh, business life actually started a lot younger than that. Um, <laughs> I read somewhere that I think you started a business at the age of 12. Um, what, what, and I don't know if you can remember this, but like, yeah. what was that? What was going through your head? Like why? Uh, and did you feel that that helped you along the way as well too? Jose, that's a good question. You know, it's funny. All my friends, when I was growing up had paper routes, they'd have to get up early in the morning, five in the morning. That was back in the day when kids actually delivered newspapers on bicycles and I wanted to make money. And I said, you know, I don't want to get up that early in the morning and go deliver papers. So I went out and bought a, um, a lawnmower, a power mower, and uh, started mowing lawns. So I got it on my Stingray bicycle. I towed the lawnmower behind my bicycle and went up and down my street and got several uh, gardening jobs. Um, and so I was mowing people's lawns after school. And that was my, that was my start in business. And Obviously, it was uh, not real lucrative, but it was a start. And, and I've always been entrepreneurial. I figure, you know, I'd rather work for myself than work for someone else. And I, and I did work for other people for short periods of time, but found that um, I, I enjoyed having control of my own destiny. Love it. And, and where do you think you got that from, like about having control of your own destiny? Is that like, uh, was your father, did he work for himself? Like your uncle, where did that come from? It came from, I had a couple of, of significant mentors in my life. I learned early on to gravitate to people who were more successful and more experienced than myself. So my uncle who owned the janitorial business was an entrepreneur. He owned this business. He had many inventions. He invented all kinds of different steam cleaning machines and 
and made a lot of money doing that. And then I had an uncle that lived up in Canada, my uncle Sam, who owned um, hotels and a restaurant business up there and several liquor stores. So I would always talk to them about how they did it and what they did. And and the, the same thing came true with both of them of what their thoughts were is taking care of people, creating long lasting relationships, being there for your clients and your friends will create amazing results for you. And uh, so it was, it was hard work. <laughs> Owning your own business is not easy, but it's following through. It's making the commitment. It's having clarity. It's, it's really having a grasp on where you are and where you want to go. And that's what I learned from those two mentors and, and many others I've had in my life. My father was, was good with people and good with sales, but he wasn't entrepreneurial. He actually came to work for me a couple of years after I opened my real estate company. Everybody thought, oh, Mark Troop, that's, that's the owner of the company. No, my dad would tell him, no, that's my son's company. So my mom and dad actually came to work for me in, in real estate, and they worked for me for many years until they retired. I love it. Um, you said you had a couple of other mentors. Who else have been mentors in, in your life aside from your uh, both of your uncles? And, 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 and what are some key lessons maybe that you picked up from different mentors? I know that for your uncle, it was about doing the right things and being true to your word, which I think is so simple, but yet so important. Well, it, it's, I've had many mentors. I've, I've, um, one of my good friends and mentors is Sam Manfredi owns a law firm in Westlake village. Um, and he runs a, a great operation. So him and I, get together frequently and talk about different things and, and come up with ideas and, and we benefit from each other. So mentors are, are not always unilateral. It's you learn from each other. So I learned quite a bit from him. And one of the gentlemen that has probably been one of the most impactful mentors uh, in my life is uh, my coach, business coach, Eddie Jacobs. He was a coach of mine for about 22 years and we're still friends to this day. And Coach Eddie and I would meet once a week. We'd always meet at Starbucks. I'd have to do the face-to-face. -face. We'd do a one hour. And when I started with him uh, a little over 22 years ago, he sat down and said, Brian, if we decide to work together, I'll be your coach. You have to um, take this commitment that you will pay forward. In other words, what I teach you, you're going to teach other people. So I'm going to coach you and you need to coach other people. So what I did is I took his word and I followed through with what my word was, which I'm going to learn as much as I can from this man. And I've been coaching for many years too, both realtors and loan officers and various people in the business, because I've accumulated so much knowledge and experience that I want to share that with people. I want, and I only share it with people that are willing to learn from it. Because not everybody's teachable, not everybody's coachable. And um, I found that out the hard way. I'd beat my head against the wall trying to teach people that were unteachable, that didn't weren't open to the possibility. And I'm sure, Jose, you know what I'm talking about. You, you try and share something with someone. If they're not open to that possibility, they're not going to learn from you. And then how are you able to determine which people are open to the possibility and which ones aren't? Because... It's funny, uh, I used to work at Remax, and at that point I told the broker of the company, I'm, I told them, I'm gonna be your number one agent. And at some point I became the number one agent. I was number two, number three for a long time. And I asked them, I said, did you believe it when I told you that I was gonna be your number one agent? And he said, no. And I said, why not? He's like, because everybody tells me that. And in, in real estate, you get a lot of people that come in here and be like, oh my God, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And then you try to help them and then they don't, they don't actually do what is required to be able to succeed. Like, how are you able to determine like which ones were the ones that uh, maybe were open to the coaching or which ones you wanted to pour more energy into? So what I do is, um, and I did this for the 22 years I spent with Coach Eddie, is I would take notes every time uh, from his teachings to me. And it would be a matter of, okay, here's what you need to work on. Here's your homework. In a week from now, I want a report back. So I 
take my notes, I'd go do my work. And believe me, it was never easy. It was always deep thinking and, and having to change what you do on a daily basis. But I, I put the work in, I put the effort in. So I did the same thing. If I sat down with someone, I'd say, okay, I want you to get out that magic weapon, a pen. This isn't just going in one ear and out the other and a piece of paper and take notes. And they take notes. And then a week later, I meet with them. And if they didn't do the homework I gave them, I'd give them one more chance. I'd say, okay, I'll understand. But if you make a commitment, follow through with it. And uh, the ones that weren't committed, I wasn't going to waste my time. Um, the people that are, I still coach. Um, uh, I think you know the name David Honda. He's one of my loan officers. I meet with him regularly. He takes notes and he follows through. He does his job. He does the things that are required to make the changes to become a better person, to become a better loan officer. And that's really what it's all about. I want to see people succeed, but I know I can only help so many that are willing to make that effort. So I spend my time and energy and effort today on people I know are willing to make the change, make that commitment and follow through with what they say. Love it. So I, you mentioned to me, I think this was off camera that you sold your first property within four days of getting licensed. What do you attribute that to? And then for agents maybe that are watching, like if they wanted to have that level of just like immediate like success, what do you think is required or what trends do you see in people who succeed at a high level in real estate? So I, I think it was pure luck. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so I had my license. I got an up call and you know what an up call is. And they wanted to see the least expensive property. I started in real estate in Chatsworth and they said mm -hmm. they wanted to see the least expensive house on the market at the time. It was $58,000 in Canoga Park. And it was mm -hmm. not in a great area. We went and looked at the house. And I did all the things I could remember from my fast start training. I said, do you see yourself living here? Do you think this room is big enough? Do you like the kitchen? You know, all the asking questions. And they had all the buying signs. We walked out the door and they said, we like the house. We'd like to put an offer in on it. I said, great. I got the contract out. This is back when we hand wrote them, put it on the hood of my car and wrote the contract on the hood of my car. <laughs> Love it. That was my first sale, and it, and uh, they were great clients and easy to work with. But it's it's just reading the buying signs and not trying to force things through to people. So many salespeople are focused on one thing, Jose, and they see a buyer and they see dollar signs on their forehead. And what I always mm -hmm. tell people is always look at what's best for the client. If it's best for them to get involved in buying today and this is the best situation for them, then you lead them to that decision. But if it's not right, if there are problems in their lives and their financials, whatever it is, you lead them to make a decision to wait, do it when the timing's right, um, because that'll come back to you tenfold. I've had people that um, wanted to sell a house and I, I tell them, no, I'm not going to take your listing right now because you're not ready. You need to do this, this and this. And they would thank me years later. Um, so it's just doing the right thing for people and, and leading them in the right direction. And then your reputation is, is much stronger because then it, you're not caring about the dollars. The dollars follow. If you take care of people, the money will come. That's just how it is. That's how our business is. It's funny. It reminds me of a for sale by owner, Brian, that I had. And he wanted to sell after a year because the market had gone up. And I told them, look, I don't know if you're aware you're going to pay capital gains on this. Had no idea anything about capital gains. He decided not to sell because he wouldn't have made anything. He was going to make 50000 would have paid a lot of it in capital gains because it was such a short period of time. Uh, now I've worked with that client maybe like three to four times where I've sold three to four other properties. But that I earned his business where he knew that he can come to me and we were going to maybe make him aware of things that he wasn't aware of versus taking the commission. And it was like, I remember when I did that, it's like I passed up a commission, but looking back at it, it obviously um, has served me very well in, in the career. What I wanted to ask you is how long were you an agent for? And, sure. and what's the most amount of units that you did on a yearly basis? 
and then we can go into into the transition of uh, of a of uh, a broker slash manage manager after that. So um, back in the day <laughs> when I first started in the late seventies and early eighties, I was doing about eight to ten transactions a month, um, and that got me in, into the the top echelon, so to speak. Um, then I got into management and management took a lot of my time, but I was still selling pretty solid. Once I got into ownership, which um, was 84 when I partnered with these two other guys, I scaled back a lot of my sales and focused more efforts on managing. And uh, when I when I had um, my real estate operation started in, in May of 87, I was still selling. Um, in fact, I was working a farm area, you're familiar with farm areas, right? Uh, yeah. About 1200 homes. And I'd knock on doors uh, five days a week. I was door knocking and I was cold calling and I was mailing. I was doing all those things. I rented ice cream trucks uh, on hot days and I had my name on the side of it. I rented a, a whole movie theater for a night at the movies with my clients. I did all those things. And I had a 70% market share in my farm area when I, when I stopped Which marketing. Unbelievable market share. So, that means that out of every hundred homes, you were selling, basically. You were like yeah. the go-to uh, I was person. the go-to. I, I was the Kleenex of the neighborhood. In other words, you think of tissue, you think of Kleenex. When they thought of selling, it was always Brian Troop. And what was amazing, 10 years after I stopped, I, I literally stopped selling because I wanted to focus on the growth of my business. And that's part of what my coach taught me is you, you can't be effective as a full-time salesperson and a full-time CEO growing a huge company. So I, I pulled back and I know a lot of other brokers do it successfully, but I think I was more successful with my business because I did give up the sales side. But 10 years after I stopped door knocking, I get a phone call from a client said, Brian, I need to sell my house. I said, well, I'll refer you to one of my top realtors, but I'm not selling anymore. He goes, no, you don't understand. We have to have you. You are the guy that was in here working day in and day out. That was the last mm -hmm. listing I took, but I did take it for him because mm -hmm. it was like, you have to take, you have to do this for me. It was that, it was that passionate ask. And I said, okay, I'll do it this one time. But um, growing my business, I found it was, was much easier. And, and like I mentioned to you early on, Jose, the most important thing in my life is my family. When my kids were growing up, they both played club soccer. My wife and I would go to all the soccer games. Um, I would be there um, at halftime. I'd be on my phone making phone calls, but I was always there for my kids at their sporting events, all the activities, uh, all those things, because Money is only worth so much, but family is the most important thing. And, and everybody understood that Brian's always in communication, always in contact, but he always has time, both vacation, took time off. Um, that was another thing I learned from my grandfather. I, I didn't even mention him and probably one of the most important mentors in my life. Um, he was a salesman. I'm sure you remember Bob's big boy. And Wiener yeah. Schnitzel, he sold restaurant equipment. And uh, he traveled all across the country and he learned because he had uh, some health issues. And the doctor said, Harry, you've got to take time off for yourself. Otherwise, these ulcers will eat you alive and you'll die. He ended up living to 90. But the bottom line is he started taking vacations. So I learned from him. He said, Brian, every time you do something, you reward yourself. You set goals, you reward yourself. So every time I opened a real estate office, I learned this from my grandfather. I took one week vacation additional a year. I got up to 10 real estate offices and I was doing 10 weeks a year. I opened the 11th office and my right hand person who's still with me today, Debbie McCarthy, she was my chief operations officer. She said, you're not getting another week off. You got too much vacation time already. So I said, okay, Debbie, we'll leave it at 10 weeks a year. But I, I was able to to work hard and play hard. That was, that was always my philosophy. That was always what I did. And I rewarded myself for the hard work and the growth I did in my company. I love it. So uh, 
10 weeks is almost like once every month, almost a little bit like oh, yeah. once every <laughs> month and a week, a week off, just so people understand that. I love that. Um, you know what it made me think of whenever you gave up? And I think that this is very hard for people, um, especially when you're setting, selling 80, 90 homes in a year. It's very hard for somebody to give that up to go to somewhere else. Um, and there's a saying that it's really hard to be the coach and the and a player at the same time, meaning a lot of people want to be the coach, but also the player. But it almost like it almost like holds them back. There's this other saying that you can't get to second base if you have your foot on first. You got to let go of first in order to get to second base. So that made you a lot better of a of a of a manager and an owner. So before we get into the ownership, because this is the part that I'm really curious about, because we're going through something similar right now, where we're growing in Ventura County and we're attracting agents. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know a little bit more about that. But if somebody wanted to sell eight to 10 homes a year in today's marketplace, what advice would you give them? A year or a month? No, it's just right. I meant a month. If somebody wants to say eight to 10, eight to 10 homes a month. And, and, and that's a distinction because um, whenever you said eight to 10 a month, that's anywhere from 96 to 120 homes in a year. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to do that today, in Ventura County specifically, how would they go about doing that? Well, you know, there there's a combination of things. And one of the things that I think is real important and real relevant is getting involved in local communities. So if you're going to, let's say, want to sell eight to 10 homes in a very specific market, then obviously farming is one of the key areas, which, um, there's not a whole lot of people that do it, but there are still some realtors that are out there actually door knocking. And, and my belief is that door knocking is still a, a critical part. I think social media is great, but that augments what you do. That doesn't create the business. Um, but I think one of the other things is people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And to me, um, I've always been involved in the local community. I've I spent nine years on the uh, board for the Boys and Girls Club. I've been on the Police Foundation board. I've, I've given my time to various nonprofits over the years. And I can't tell you how much business has come out of that. But I know that, again, it's a boomerang effect. What you put out there is what you get back. So whether you join a Rotary Club, you, you YMCA, Boys and Girls, whatever it is, get involved in the local community, get to know people. Once people see who you are, if you're doing it for the goodness of that uh, venue, uh, they'll see that and then they'll be attracted to you. And what that's doing is you're creating a reputation and people work with you based on your reputation, your level of integrity, your honesty, uh, you're caring about people, you're caring about the community, and that's, it, it's building in sales, you're really doing one thing, you're building a business, just like a real estate company, only you're a real estate company within a real estate company. So if you want to do eight to 10 units a month, um, you have to set your goals, and it's really a numbers game. That's all it is. If you go to seminars, you'll learn what the numbers are. I don't know what they are today, but how many doors you have to hit, how many calls you've got to make, how many uh, handwritten notes. I can't tell you how many kids I talk to. I said, get out a pencil and paper and handwrite a note. Hey, it was great meeting you, John and Mary. Looking forward to helping you in three months, six months, whatever it is. And you send them back that little handwritten card because everybody uses text, everybody uses email, but very few people take the time to handwrite a personal note. And it's the little things like that that make a big difference in impact. And you've got to stand out. You've got to bring value, but you've got to stand out. You ha can't be just like everybody else. Yeah. What, what was the transition like from manager to owning your own office like what did you have to learn from going from agent to manager from manager to having your own office and also what did you have to unlearn as well too <laughs> if anything at all so what i had to learn was um managing people not just managing myself so there's there's a big learning curve and some people are capable of it and some aren't um 
salespeople, uh, Jose, I hate to say it, but it's like herding cats. Um, you have some that are very loyal, that are hardworking, that will do whatever and will back you. And then you have others that only care about one thing themselves. How much is in it for me? I don't care if the company makes money or not, but I've got to have what I've got to have. And I always found that I liked working with the people that understood the whole picture. Um, give me a little bit, let me have a few dollars and I'll give you everything. I'll make you successful. And that's what I always did. I found that um, giving salespeople the tools, giving them a good commission split, giving them the support systems. And, and this is where it really came in. Um, I owned an escrow company and a title company and a mortgage company. And the one thing I learned early on, because I was a top producing realtor, is realtors really want one thing. They want great service. They want communication. They want to know what's going on now, not tomorrow, not in five minutes, but they've got their client wants to know what's going on. So if you have an escrow company, Jose, if you open an escrow company, let's say your escrow company needs to provide the highest level of service for you and your clients, right? Because otherwise mm -hmm. you don't want to put your name on it. And that's how I always was. I always wanted to provide the very best service for my realtors and for their clients so that they wouldn't have to feel guilty about asking for that piece of business. And that's what supported my real estate business. Because as you know, the real estate game is very compressed and there's not a lot of profit in it for the brokers. So they have to have the ancillary service. They have to have the escrow and the mortgage and the title companies and so on and so forth. What, what were some of the challenges during that transition? If any. Yeah. The, the, the challenge was just learning the game. Um, but I've always been very good at, at games. In fact, my favorite game when I was growing up as a boy was Monopoly. And I play that to this day with real estate, with real real estate. Um, but it's, it's just learning all the ins and outs of business. And probably the hardest transition I had um, was dealing with the negative effects in business. And when you own your own company, you have the bigger you get, the more liability you have and the more litigious things become. So I still remember when I had my first lawsuit claim hit me, I had E&O insurance, no problem. I went into my attorney's office, I said, this is a BS claim. We have no liability here. I want to fight this thing. I, you know, no way we're responsible. If I did something wrong or my agent did something wrong, I'll write a check tomorrow. But this is not right. And I want to fight this. And my attorney sat me down in his chair, Sam and Freddie, one of my mentors. He said, Brian, we have to give in. The insurance company is going to put in this. You're going to put in this. You can fight it but you're going to lose. The only ones that will win are going to be me and the other attorney. And that was the hardest transition for me as a person of integrity in sales. So what I learned is the hardest thing in business was dealing with the, the litigation. So I brought on a um, gal by the name of Laura Lee Anthony, and uh, she had a law degree from Pepperdine, and she was an expert mediator arbitrator, and she handled all of the I call it the negative side of the business, the um, problem people, the, the challenges. So I could focus 100% on growth and coaching. Um, so I kept a positive, upbeat attitude and I let her deal with all the negative stuff. And that really gave me the yin and the yang in my business to create what I created. Without Laura Lee, I, I don't know that I could have accomplished what I did because she gave me the ability and the freedom to get out of the trenches, if you know what I mean, because those things do creep up no matter what. The more business you do, the more challenges come up in our business. And then how do you attract people like that? Like meaning like, obviously, like whenever you're growing a company, you need other good people. And uh, maybe sometimes when you're starting up a company, there isn't a bunch of financial resources at that point. Early on in your career, um, how did you go about attracting these types of people? Was it always just financial? Was it uh, culturally driven? Was it um, uh, any ownerships in any of the companies? What was the kind of vision or the model there? So what I found early on is um, 
surround myself with people that are smarter than me and better than me at certain areas because I didn't have all the answers. I didn't have all the knowledge. I didn't know the HR rules and regulations. I had to find the people. So what I did was um, I, I asked a lot of questions. I talked to some of my mentors. Um, in fact, before I hired Laura Lee Anthony, one of the things I did was I was ready to hire my own in-house counsel to fight every single fraudulent or frivolous uh, claim that came against me because I was tired of, of rolling over. And my good friend and attorney told me, he said, Brian, here, you need to meet Laura Lee Anthony. She's owned her own business. She worked at another big brokerage. She'd be great for you. So it's being open to possibilities and um, taking the time to research and ask the right questions. And again, surround yourself with people that have better or or more ability than you have in certain areas, filling that void. So you have a little bit of both, because if you all have the same talents and treasures, it doesn't work. You have to have all the whole array. It's, it's like a smorgasbord. You have to have a little bit of everything to make it all work. It's a secret sauce um, when you put it all together. And I've, I've found that um, hiring people and taking good care of them. So one of the things I did, Jose, is I didn't always pay him the highest salary, but what I always did is I gave him the highest bonus structure of any company out there based on performance. Could you imagine professional sports if they gave him a $1 million a year salary instead of 40 million a year salary and bonused them every time they made a hoop or a touchdown or whatever, you bonus them on that. And that's what I always did. So no matter what the market was going up or coming down, I didn't have a huge overhead from the standpoint of big, big salaries. I had fair salaries, but I had a huge bonus structure. So the more they produced, the more they could create for our company, the better they did. And it worked well. My managers made great money and, and it was all tied to incentives and bonuses. And, and that worked out well. Uh, it worked out well for them and for me. And it also reduced the downsides as well, too, because if the company wasn't doing well, the monthly overhead wasn't like this ginormous dollar amount. Um, who did you learn about the bonus structures from? Was there a mentor in your life that kind of, was there a book that you read on that? Like, how did you learn how to structure those types of uh, opportunities for people? Trial and error. <laughs> so um, I, I guess the, the biggest uh, transition occurred um, back in 2008. You remember that? Yeah. Um, so I had some higher salaries at the time and lower bonus structure, and I had to restructure the entire company uh, because of the losses we were mounting very quickly. And had I not made those changes dramatically fast at the time, I wouldn't have made it through that cycle. But um, what I did was I, I reduced everybody's payroll. I said, look, guys, we can either do this or I can do massive layoffs. We'll, we'll increase your bonus structure to this. I'm going to give you A, B, C, and D. And Debbie McCarthy and myself and Laura Lee Anthony put our heads together. We kind of had a think tank. Um, I'm the, more the sales. They're more of the level-headed um, kind of ops. And we put our thoughts together. And, and what was cool is I had 18 managers. I had 14 offices and 18 managers. So I had regular manager meetings and we'd We'd do think tanks uh, once a year. We'd spend three days in a retreat uh, brainstorming. I'd hire a professional um, person to come out and, and train us and really dive deep on where we're at, what our six-month goal is, one-year goal, and five-year goal. We were always working on our goals and what we had to do to change and to challenge ourselves to be better at what we did. So it's, it's a constant it's a process. There's no destination in success. It's a journey and you're always changing and you, you've always got to measure what you're doing and measure where you're going and how you're going to get there. And there's no unrealistic goals. There's just unrealistic timelines. So from time to time, we had to change our timelines. You know, we want to hit this goal by June. Well, we're not going to hit it till December. That's okay. Let's hit it in December. And, and we we change the timeline. 
And whenever you were hiring managers, you said, I think like 18 of them at some point, um, what did you look for? Like what qualities or attributes did you look for somebody that would potentially be a good manager? And then obviously I imagine that there was a, a lot of trial and error. Um, what did, what did you not want in a manager? So what I didn't want, and one of the things that I made it very clear, any manager I brought aboard, I did not want them competing with my agents. So if they were going toe to toe on a listing and it was from their same office, um, I wanted them to, to just tell the seller, Hey, look, Mary's a great realtor list with her. Um, I will back her up. I'm her manager and walk away and let Mary have that listing. Um, because that way it would be a more, uh, workable scenario. And I know a lot of companies don't do it that way. They just let the dust fall where it falls. And then there's hard feelings with salespeople. But if salespeople have the support of their manager and they know that their manager is not out competing with them, they feel more comfortable sharing all of what's going on in their life with their manager. So that worked out well. Um, they had to give up some because they're giving up business, but they would, I wouldn't have them door knocking or doing the mass marketing or any of that stuff. I'd have them work in their client base, their database, like the Brian Buffini program, which is one of the best to this day, um, is to work the past clients in their sphere and continue to market that, but not beating doors and, and doing that because they're a manager now and I need them in the office. And back then I wanted my managers in the office five days a week. Nowadays, um, a lot of people don't even have offices anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so he, here's a transition. It's funny because I did Mike Ferry coaching for maybe about nine years. And one of the best things that they told me at some point, uh, maybe like five, six years into it, I spoke with maybe three or four different top brokers in the organization, told them I want to open up my own company. And they told me, look, how much money are you making in sales? And then they looked at what the goals were and they actually advised me to stay in sales. They're like, look, at this transition or at this period in your life, you'll make a lot more money in sales. A lot of people think that the brokers in the real estate industry make the most money. Um, is that true? Or can a salesperson have the capability of making a lot more money than the broker? And what are your thoughts on that? So I it's a very interesting question because I get asked that all the time. Um, if you had to do it all over again, Brian, what would you do? And I tell everybody the same thing. As much as I enjoyed building a real estate brokerage and building an empire of, of companies, um, had I stuck with sales that I was very good at, I would have a lot more cash, more properties and more freedom and a lot less headaches. Uh, sales is the number one top paying job in the nation, um, other than maybe an athlete, right? But it's, it's your ability to sell yourself, to provide value, to do a great job. And the good part about sales is you only have so much overhead. You don't have the headaches of, you know, at, at the peak of my uh, business, I had over a thousand people working for me, both staff and salespeople. So, the amount of headaches, the amount of challenges on a daily basis are astronomical. Whereas sales, you may have a team of four or five people or even 10 people, but it's it's a compressed business model that's a lot easier to manage. That's a lot easier to uh, walk away when you want to make a change. Or if, if you decide, hey, you know what, I want to go from company A to company B, you can easily do that. Uh, whereas when you own something, when you have brick and mortar and you have hard expenses, it's it's real easy to uh, real difficult to trim those Kidding. costs down when the market takes a dump. You can you can let go of two or three of your staff people, but you don't have the brick and mortar and you don't have the um, all the W-2 wages that uh, weigh you down. So in the down markets, um, I would have done really a lot better had I not owned a, a huge operation. Yeah, it's funny because that was probably one of the best advice that that those brokers gave me. And sure enough, like I've made uh, grossed over seven figures 
and in one year over two figures and uh, basically for the last seven years, I would say. And that was like one of the best advice because, uh, and I gave that same advice to another agent one time and he thought I was trying to discourage him from going after his dream, but it was just like, no, like if you really just focus on sales, you have the capability of growing something really large and having a lot less risk associated uh, with it. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, whenever you would meet with agents, like early on when you were growing your company, um, whenever you didn't have a lot of agents, what was your value add to the agents? What was like the proposition? What was the the thing that would make Troop Real Estate different than maybe a Coldwell Banker or some of these other companies? And how did you go about like delivering this message to the agents? So it's it's kind of a interesting question. And I'll, and I'll tell you that the beginning of my business in May of 87, my whole goal back then, Jose, was to open an office with 12 top producing people that I already knew several in the Simi Valley area. That's where I started my career. And that's all I wanted because I wanted just a network of individuals, including myself, that were working on selling real estate in a high level of integrity. Day one, when I opened my company, I had 18 people and I was already expanding. So it was a law of attraction. It wasn't, um, I don't I don't know that it, I can really put my finger on what it was that happened, but I had no desire, no drive, no ambition, no thought process of opening a multi-office operation and becoming the number one in Ventura County. It, it happened as a result of, I guess, being in the right place at the right time, looking at opportunities, because we have opportunities every day. And not that I haven't made mistakes, but I've made better choices along the way than I've made bad choices, if you know what I mean. Um, I broke into the West County um, way back when Fred Sands uh, mm -hmm. was shutting down their operation. I uh, went in and bought Fred Sands, Mason Churchill, uh, mm -hmm. Randy Churchill, still selling real estate to this day up in Camarillo. He's a great guy. Yeah. But uh, Bill Mason and Randy Churchill owned the, the company. And I met with them and they had four offers. And mine wasn't the highest offer, but I wanted to get into West County. I wanted to get into Camarillo. And the reason they chose my offer is because of who I was, because of my background, because giving to the community, being involved in doing various charity fundraising, being involved in the Boys and Girls Club. They liked me as a human being. Uh, they liked the fact that I cared about people, not just dollars. And so they chose my offer. And that was the beginning of my growth into uh, the West County. And then I hired a guy, uh, God rest his soul, Bob Harrison, to be my uh, West County manager. And Bob, Bob was a great guy. And many people in uh, West County know that name, Bob Harrison. And, and him and I opened a lot of offices together out there, including one up in Ojai. And um, he knew everybody in West County. And so there again, I, I surrounded myself with a quality individual, had a great reputation. People loved him. They wanted to work for him because he cared about people. And so having the right managers, having the right players like that made it really easy. It, it was like a no brainer. It was like all of a sudden these opportunities are opening up left and right. Whereas if I hired the wrong individual or the wrong manager or whatever, it, it was destined to fail. So that was a big part of it. And, and I had never had a problem with uh, paying people well for what they're bringing to the table. And a lot of companies are, are short-sighted and they, they're not willing to spend the extra dollars for the high, high level talent. And if you're not willing to pay the price, you're not gonna get the best talent. When you have A players, you're gonna have more success. When you have B players, you have less and C drops down. So I've seen more companies not do what they need to do to be successful in those areas. How did you know he was the right person for the job? I did some uh, research. I talked to people. Um, I spent the time. You know, one of the things um, I learned early on in my career is hire slow, fire fast. <laughs> so 
if you take your time and you do a little due diligence and you do a little background check and you talk to people, you talk to realtors, you talk to the top producers, um, you find out real quick who the players are and who the respected players are. And one of the things, Jose, I did over the years is um, I never had a problem firing a top producer if they lacked integrity. And I had a guy, I'll never forget, I won't mention names, but he was one of my top producers and he did something illegal and I fired him on the spot. And he said, Brian, how can you do this? Um, I said, well, when you cross the line, I have a problem with that. You're no longer a part of my team. You're not honorable. And this, you can't deny it. Uh, you did it. So it, it's showing people that money's not everything, that reputation is the most important thing. And my reputation in the community in with my realtors and, and my loan officers and everybody knows that um, it's important to have that level of integrity. And then people want to work for you because if you don't fire people, even if they're top producers and they're a bunch of, you know what, I won't say the word, um, mm -hmm. you don't want to surround yourself with a bunch of people that you don't want to be around that have a bad reputation. So to me, reputation was everything. It was the most important thing. And um, that's how I've always lived my life. And I can sleep at night and I don't have to worry about people doing things that are illegal or immoral that work with me or for me. Yeah. Um, you talked about how you like playing games and in order to play a game, I think the first thing is understanding the rules of the game. Yes. And if you understand the rules of the game, then that allows you to go out and actually play the game to win. So what would you say the rules to the game are if you want to be a successful broker, meaning the owner of a company? And what would you say the rules of the game are if you want to be a successful agent? So the rules of the game, in my mind, for a broker or owner of a real estate company are get to know the players in your market. I love it. Um, learn who they are and what their reputations are and learn to get along with them. If you're going to have problems, people are going to leave your company for another company and vice versa. So treat that realtor with respect as they're leaving because if you leave the door open i found this many times jose i'd have realtors would leave me the grass was greener over here because i left the door open i treated them right on the way out i let them take their business with them six months a year two years later they come back to work for me as long as yeah i wanted them back obviously mm -hmm. but when you burn a bridge it's burned forever and mm -hmm. so treat people with the respect you don't always have to trust everybody because not everybody's trustworthy, but respect people, um, make sure that you um, communicate well. And when a problem comes up, pick up the phone and talk to people and, and work through those problems. For, for a realtor, um, it's, it's very similar. I mean, you, you've just got to um, be involved and do things in the right manner and, and do things up front and, and leave some money for your broker. Uh, don't be all about you. Um, know that your broker's got to make money. Know that wherever you're going, whatever real estate company, there's there's a dozen different real estate companies that you can work for, but find one that has a good reputation with a good manager, good broker that you can talk to and people that can mentor you because the most important thing is surrounding yourself with people that are going to help bring you up when you're down help cheer you up when you're you're upset and and also that you can learn from some skills some sales skills some team building skills there's all kinds of things that a, a realtor can gain from their environment of who they're working with yeah throughout your life brian what, what do you think has driven you like meaning obviously you've achieved like great things but like what, what uh, is it like recognition is it uh, helping other people? Like what drives Brian Troop at the end of the day? Good question. Um, I guess the easiest way to put that is what drives me is, is accomplishing various goals, um, doing better, being a better person every single day. Uh, my goals are different today than they were uh, back as I was growing a company. So I have, I have different 
a thought process, but as I was building my business, it was, it was not about, um, achieving everything for me, but achieving, um, the recognition as being the number one player. That was, that was my goal was to take over that number one spot. I was very competitive. I'm still competitive to this day. Um, I don't quit until I win and I don't win to step on the other guy. I win in a way that I'm going to earn it. I'm going to show that um, this is what it's all about, creating a better environment for my people to create a family feel. You know, that was the one thing we always touted was Troop Real Estate was, uh, had corporate structuring, but had a family feel. So everybody felt like they were a part of a family, part of a team rather than this big conglomerate of a corporation. So it was always, I cared about people. I went in three or four days a week. I went into four to five offices and I would just pick people's brains. I would walk in and back then everybody was in the office every day. So I would talk to people. I would see how they're doing. I'd take somebody to lunch, somebody to coffee every single day and just creating those long-term relationships, which I still have to this day. I still see people that worked for me 20 years ago. I go to lunch and coffee with them because I care about them. I'm, I'm not there just to gain business from them. I'm there because I care about them and they know that about me. And, and to this day, I still write birthday cards, handwritten birthday cards to all my old people. So it's, it's just a, a connection um, I feel that is important is having that personal relationship with the people that work with you. I love it. At some point you decided to sell troop real estate, right? What yes. was the reasoning for that? What, uh, what uh, are you happy with that decision? Um, looking back at it, what was going through your mind at that time? So over the years I had, many opportunities. I had many people uh, trying to purchase my company and I did not want to do any of that at that time. But what my goal was back when I was building my company was to have my son, Scott, and my daughter, Kayla, who are both licensed in real estate, take over the company. That was my dream. That was my vision. It was like, this is a family business and I want you guys to take it over. So a couple of years before I sold the company, I sat down with them and I said, okay, guys, um, I've got to start working on my exit strategy and I want you guys to take over the company. And they sat me down and they said, okay, dad, we appreciate what you built. We know you work your butt off, but that's not for us. That's not who we are. We don't want to work as hard as you do. Um, we don't want to put that uh, time and effort into um, our careers and we'd rather not own the company. So that was, that broke my heart, but I understood because they were grown and uh, they make their own decisions. So I started looking for the right fit and the right company and, and um, uh, to merge with or, or sell to. And, and uh, when I selected the company I did, I thought it was the right fit for my people. I thought it was going to be a good experience for the most part. Um, it worked out well for me personally, but, um, to watch the company, um, kind of get dismantled over the last several years, that was heartbreaking. Uh, it was heartbreaking when they changed the name and did all the things they did, but, uh, that was their thought process and I couldn't control that. Um, but what I had built was, was a good reputation and a great company. And those, those people to this day are still a part of my life. Um, Love so it. timing was it good? I think it was good because I was uh, getting to a point in my life, Jose, where I had more responsibility than I wanted and I wanted to do a little bit less. Uh, so I actually sold the real estate company and the escrow company. Um, at that time, I owned a title company and another escrow company with a partner of mine and then um, also had the mortgage company. So I still had plenty. Everybody thought, oh, Brian's retired now. No, Brian's only got two businesses now instead of four businesses. So uh, I, I've kept pretty busy. And, and uh, about a year and a half ago, I sold the title company. Um, so I'm down to this one company, which is my family, CSMC Mortgage. I love it. I love it. 
Um, here's the last question. And then I do want to get into like what Brian Troop is in, in uh, doing now. So I do want to do that. Um, uh, and it's funny because you would think that more real estate agents own real estate because you're so involved in the transaction. But when you look at the data, a very small percentage of them actually own what they're selling aside from their primary residence. So uh, what got you into wanting to buy real estate? Um, what advice would you give to somebody like uh, agents about buying the product? And let's start there. Yeah. So I'll go back. Um, like I said, I started buying property when I was 19 and bought almost every single year. And even when I couldn't afford to buy, I would do a 1031 exchange. So I'd take one of my properties and exchange it for, you know, I go from a single family to a fourplex or whatever it was. I still remember um, back 30 plus years ago, I exchanged a fourplex and two single family properties into a 30 unit building with a partner of mine, Vicki Yates, who's still a good friend of mine. But the the one thing I learned is is always get your real estate working for you. I, I looked at the most successful people in the country and they all made their money in oil or real estate. And so that was, I chose real estate. I wasn't in the oil business, but what I can say is people always think, oh, Brian, you must have bought everything at the bottom of the market. No, I, I bought at the peak of the market too. But the one thing I always looked at is cash flow. Same here. If you have vacancies, you got to be able to afford those vacancies, you've got to cash flow it out. If you have positive cash flow coming from an investment over here, now you can take on a negative cash flow from this. And um, I always worked to pay my properties off in 15 years. Uh, whether I had a 15 year mortgage or not didn't matter. I always chunked down principal because you got to think out if you're paying on a 30 year mortgage, most people will never have that thing paid off to enjoy the cash flow. So pay it off early. Um, and if you can't afford your market, I'll give you an example. Um, one of my uh, realtors and she was a manager in my Moore Park office, Nicole Romanowski. We still talk to this day. She's a great lady. Um, I gave her the advice of buying a piece of property every year till she got up to 14 properties and then get them all paid off. She couldn't afford in the Ventura County area. So she bought out in Palmdale, Lancaster. And this was back when it was less expensive out there, still is to this day. And she has 14 properties free and clear. Great she awesome. works part time in real estate and she travels all across the world. And she thanks me this day for that advice because she's financially independent because she bought those 14 properties. Had she not listened to me, like most people, like you mentioned, most realtors don't own their own properties. Um, you got no retirement plan. You got no pension. You're going to be 70 years old, still selling houses and not have any money. And then when you get Social Security, you're going to get 3000 a month. That's not enough to live on. So my advice to any of you realtors out there is buy real estate, high market, low market. Um, and even though rates are high, a lot of sellers are carrying paper now. So ask the seller to carry paper, uh, do a land contract, do all kinds of things, get creative right now, uh, but buy property. Remember, you don't, you don't uh, marry the mortgage, you marry the house. So um, buy now, even if it's a 7% rate and refinance in a year from now when rates come down. Uh, that's my best advice and, and then pay them off early. Uh, it's the best way to go. It's interesting because you said something about creative, about being creative with uh, like carrying paper, learning uh, subject to um, wrap around mortgages. And it's it's interesting because as long as you're able to adapt as a real estate agent, then you can succeed in any marketplace. There's always going to be sales. It's just are you adapting to whatever is going on in the marketplace? And I think that's what you've uh, done really well. So I did want to uh, finish off the segment uh, by just asking, what is Brian Troop up to now? Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about the company that you're running, uh, what the vision for that company is, and uh, yeah. Jose, thank you. I appreciate the time today, and I've had a lot of fun and. Uh, what's what's Brian Troop doing now? More of the same of what I've been doing since I started my career. I, I uh, the only difference is instead of work hard, play hard. I work less 
and play more. Uh, my team knows that they can always reach me. I, I carry my cell phone day and night. Um, but the bottom line is I have uh, four beautiful grandchildren now. And so I spend a lot of time with my grandkids. I spend a lot of time with my kids. Um, I spend a lot of time up in Mammoth. I'm, I'm an avid snowboarder and a skier. Um, I've got a house on a lake. We do a lot of wake surfing and that kind of stuff. So I, I spend a lot of time at the lake and um, I just enjoy life. I travel um, and then um, I'm involved in uh, the mortgage business, which is uh, a challenging market right now, but that too shall change. Uh, there's ups and downs to every business. And, and as rates come back down, things will get better for everybody. So I, I'm a cheerleader and a captain to my sales force. And, and uh, we're, we're still out there plugging along and we've got five branches. We're in um, Simi Valley, we're in Westlake, we're up in Ventura. We're in Valencia and we've got a branch out in Northridge. And so we do business all throughout Southern California. And, and actually, believe it or not, Jose, we're licensed in 13 different states. So we're doing stuff in Texas and, and um, uh, Utah and Colorado and, and various states um, because a lot of people are moving from California. So we do we do loans out of state as well. So it's, it's a fun business. And uh I spend a lot of time with my my real estate properties. I have a property manager that helps me, but I I still like to get my fingers in the game and and keep an eye on things. I go to my buildings and take a look at them, and I walk them uh, all the time because I want to know. I want to I want to create a an environment where people are happy living in the units that I own. So I'm always updating them, remodeling them, painting them. Um, because I, I look for a better quality of person that lives in my rental properties. So I want to keep them looking nice. I love it. I love it. Any final words, Brian, to maybe somebody who watched this interview, any last piece of advice to somebody maybe looking to get into real estate, any piece of advice to a young Brian troop out there looking to take over the world? My only advice is this. If you make a commitment to do it, then stick with it, work hard. Um, talk to people, be willing to adjust and adapt and find what works best for you. And, and it's funny because I, I did different types of prospecting from open houses to door knocking to those kind of things. There's probably 20 different buckets you can do in prospecting, but find, try them all and find three or four buckets that work for you because you've got to have different buckets to pull from because sometimes it works in this area and sometimes that area. And then surround yourself with, with mentors, uh, ask questions, take them to coffee, learn from the people that are getting it done today. Uh, that's my best advice. Got it. I just have uh, uh, one last thing. Um, what's the first word that pops into, into your mind for these following things? Family. Number one priority. Integrity. My life. Uh, business. Fun. The, even even you know I thought you were gonna say the ultimate game because it's it's a it's a game, um, and then just real estate. My life. I love it, um, Brian. If somebody wanted to maybe get in touch with you uh, and wanted to connect with you or wanted to even connect with one of the loan officers in your company, maybe somebody wants to do a refinance, somebody wants to purchase a home. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can email me, B Troop at csmcmortgage.com. Got it. So from the bottom of my heart, Brian, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to do this. I've been wanting to get to know you for a very long time just because I've heard so many great things about you. To all of our viewers, I want to say thank you for so much for taking the time. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit that subscribe button. If you feel that this episode will help somebody out, make sure to hit that share button. Once again, my name is Jose Luis Morales. We interviewed Brian Troop, founder of Troop Real Estate. Um, and this was another episode of the Residual Real Estate Agent Show. So thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate your time. And uh, until next time for everybody else.